Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am okay, Brian. Got all my Breeders' Cup picks set. I guess I'm ready to go for this weekend. Love it, Matt. 14 big races at Keeneland, five on Friday for uh, Future Stars Friday, and then we got nine big races on Saturday. I think Matt and I are going to roll through all 14 races pretty quick here, but we both have a good amount of long shots sprinkled in with some of our uh, uh, chalk-eating weasel picks in these 14 races. But uh, there is money to be made for sure in uh, many of these races, Matt, and we are going to jump right in with Friday, the juvenile day. We, we'll see all five of our top picks right there. We're going to start with the juvenile turf sprint, Matt. Neither of us have picked a favorite in that race. Uh, that is for sure. Yeah, no doubt. For me, Future Stars Friday turned out to be the day when I've got more long shots than uh, in any of the other races. Uh, hey, Juvenile Turf Sprint to me is about speed. It's about going fast, and it's a wide open field, and, and it is definitely not a race where I wanted to have the favorite. Yeah, you're you're on one of those speed horses. It, it it struck me as a race with a ton of speed. Of course, there's only five and a half furlongs, so speed yeah. can overcome a lot of other speed. But starting with Sharp as attack, Tyler's Tribe, there is just a ton of uh, speed there on the outside. Baffert towards Speed, Boat Beach, and Platinum Queen looks like a really fast European. I I on the other hand looked for some uh, a horse with a little bit of ability to come from off it. I don't know for sure that I found him. But I love the odds, or at least the morning line odds, on Persian Force, who's been running against good horses. He ran Blackbeard very top two starts back. In fact, he was beaten by Blackbeard in the last two. If Blackbeard hadn't been prematurely retired, Matt, he'd be a big favorite in here. Persian Force, I think, will be off the pace. He's my long shot pick in here. Tell me a little bit more about Sharp as Attack really quick. Yeah, Brian. Hey, we we're both have landed on a horse that's 15 to 1 in the morning line. And, and I don't blame you. Uh, on paper, it looks like a race that should set up for a horse coming off of the pace because there are so many fast horses in here. But like you said, it's five and a half furlongs and maybe Sharp Azteca, who is fast, can take it all the way. Um, he uh, broke his maiden out at Santa Anita and then came to Monmouth Park and won the Tyro by seven lengths in 55 and three-fifth seconds, and most recently was second in the $500,000 uh, juvenile, juvenile sprint on that wacky turf course. So already he showed a little bit, little bit of versatility in running at three different tracks, but he's fast, and I'm taking a shot on a fast horse. Yeah, and, and I can't blame you there. He's looked good, and, and that six and a half furlongs at Kentucky Downs is far from the five and a half furlongs that he'll see here. So an interesting long shot pick for you. I also want to mention Mischief Magic, who is the horse that's going to be way out of it early, but that European also has some class, and he might come running if, if this uh, 43 pace sets up, as I think it might. Moving right along to the Juvenile Phillies map, this looks like one of the races I most look forward to betting, actually. First, though, you have your pick of a Todd Pletcher runner. I do, Brian. I kind of by default ended up on Chocolate Gelato, who will be close to being the favorite, although not a really short one, seven to two on the morning line. You know, as many times as I went through the field looking for a horse to uh, uh, that I liked better than Chocolate Gelato, I just couldn't find one, Brian. Um, you know, he uh, was very impressive at Saratoga when he broke, excuse me, when she broke her maiden by eight lengths and then won the frisette on a sloppy track. So we'll take that for whatever it's worth. Was it because of the slop or, or is she a horse that's getting better? Um, I like that she's going to be coming off the pace. Yeah, I, I think it's a wide open race, but to tell you the truth, none of the horses that are, look like among the favorites really scare me or really stand out at all to me. I found another Pletcher horse who I actually like better, and it's 12 to 1 on the morning line. She's sort of a Pletcher horse. She's never run for Pletcher before. She's new to the Pletcher barn. 
But if you look at Atomically, uh, after a, a so, so uh, sprinting debut, her last two races were really impressive. She got better going seven furlongs in her maiden breaking performance in her second time out. And then the daughter of Gerben exploded at a mile of 16 uh, in a uh, restricted stakes at Gulfstream Park, uh, the uh, Florida Sire Series. But if you look, she won that race for fun. And there were some well-liked fillies in there. Also, the Colts ran that same day, and they ran quite a bit slower than Atomically did. I think Atomically is for real, and given the fact that the usual places, California, New York, and Kentucky, just look a little light to me, I'm kind of thinking that Atomically has a great shot to win this. Again, 12-1 to 1 on the morning line. What's next on the hit parade, sir? We're going juvenile Philly turf. I think it's another wide-open race. Who do you like? Another wide open race for sure, Brian. I like Be Your Best uh, from the barn of Horacio De Paz, a trainer that I have tons of respect for uh, um, as I see the kind of work that he does on a daily basis uh, in New York. She was super impressive, Brian, in her first two starts. Uh, made the special way, debut win, followed up by a win in, uh, in the PG Johnson. Um, in her third start, she ran into a really, really wet and yielding turf course in the grade two Ms. Grillo. Still finished third. Uh, I'm okay with that because I think that third place finish is going to help uh, increase the price on Be Your Best. Yeah, I think you found a filly who has a lot of potential and should have some decent odds in the juvenile filly turf. But Ms. Grillo is a, is a strange race. It looks like they just ran around the track there on that yielding turf. Pleasant Passage, the horse that won, is the highest of the horses coming out of the Miss Girl, and I can't throw her out. The horse I landed on, unfortunately, is the favorite. I just think Meditate has a clear class edge. She's been running against really, really good horses in Europe. I do wonder, though, if she wants two turns, so we'll have to wait and see. But the class stood out for me in making Meditate my top choice. But there are some interesting long shots besides your horse who should have decent odds. I was also looking at G. Laurie from the Motion Barn, who's only had two starts and certainly had some trouble up in the uh, uh, Natama up at Woodbine last time. Also, Zizera is a filly I've been talking about for a little while, and, and there's not a lot of speed in here. I hate the post, 13, but uh, she could be out on the lead if she works her way into a good trip from the outside post. Two long shots that I think have a shot, but I couldn't get past Meditate's class for my top pick, Matt. Next, we go to the biggest race, the headliner of uh, Future Stars Friday, the Breeders' Cup, uh, Keeneland here, the juvenile. And uh, I see we went with diverging picks here. I kind of like who you are picking as your top pick, Lost Ark. Yeah, I think Lost Ark is a horse that we mentioned on one of our earlier shows. Brian, I just, uh, big field, juvenile, I get it. Cave Rock was super impressive, but four to five on the morning line, even though it's Baffert and he's kind of dominated this race. Um, I, just, I, I just can't go with the favorite. I've heard that, um, I mean, he has impressive num impressive speed figures, whether you're looking at buyers or brisnets or whatever. But I, but I heard on the thoroughgraph sheets and such, um, his numbers did not come up very impressively were very similar to other horses so i'm going to take a shot with lost ark 20 to 1 on the morning line it's pletcher he was a debut winner in a maiden special weight at uh belmont park and then won the sapling at monmouth park by seven lengths finished sixth in the breeders futurity muddied up his pps a little bit but he had a tough trip in there, got steadied and checked and kind of lost the chance to do better than that. So I think uh, 20 to 1 is way too high a price on a horse like that. I agree with you. I think Lost Ark is my long shot pick in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Uh, yeah, draw a line right through that grade one Breeders' Futurity where he finished in the middle of a pack. He had way too much trouble early in the race in a, in a big field. And he passed horses to get six. I think he uh, will do much better this time. I, I just worry that Cave Rock stands over this field a little bit. He looks like 
the class to me, those races out in California, all three of them look really, really good to me. And he's bred to certainly handle two turns. I don't see a ton of speed in this race. Uh, uh, maybe the other Baffert could be the horse that challenges him early and, and maybe National Treasure winds up being the second best horse in this race. Um, not super high on uh, uh, on any of the Eastern horses, but maybe uh, maybe Blazing Sevens is another horse that could run an improved race, uh, getting a fast track finally after two straight races in the slot. But for me, it's Cave Rock and I just don't think he's uh, likely to be beaten in this juvenile. Uh, last race on Friday, Matt, the juvenile turf. We both are on the same horse. Is that the first? Yeah, that's the first time so far in these 14 races that we've agreed. We both have Silver Knot, and I think we're uh, we're getting on the Charlie Appleby bandwagon just a little bit. Yeah, we are here for sure, um, and for good reason. Uh, classy European. He's already got two group two wins uh, for Charlie Appleby. We know that Appleby won this race last year with Modern Games. It seems like he's particularly good with these younger horses. And it seems like I, I, I've heard a lot of handicappers, uh, you know, in their YouTube shows and radio shows. Uh, uh, lately, it seems to be everybody taking a shot against shots against Charlie Appleby saying he can't keep doing what he's been doing. And I, and I'm, and I say, okay, uh, let's see whether that's true or not. Uh, I don't think that's going to be true in the juvenile turf though. Maybe he's due to have a bad day. We'll see. But uh, there's a lot of Charlie Appleby runners that I like on both Friday and Saturday and silver knots. One of them silver knot just looks like a miler. He looks very classy over in Europe. And the way the Applebee's consistently run, whether we're talking about the Breeders' Cup or other stakes races throughout the year uh, in America, especially, but also going over to Dubai, Applebee shippers just do well. Silver Knot looks like the class of this race to me. And again, this is another race where I just couldn't find uh, an American that I love or, or a European long shot that I love. So Silver Knot was a pretty easy top pick for me, Matt. Are you ready to jump into Saturday? We got nine more races to go. Saturday starts with one of my favorite betting opportunities of the day, actually. So if you're ready to talk some Philly and Mare Sprint to me, we can start with that one. Let's go. We got nine races to do from the, the Saturday card. Yeah. If and is that with good night olive um i i felt when i started to pick this horse it was before the draw and the morning lines and maybe i thought that good night olive was going to be a little bit of a higher price it's chad brown and and he didn't draw the 14 post with this one he got a good post position draw with good night olive who has four wins in a row uh, um, including the grade one ballerina at Saratoga in the summer. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of nostalgia for me in picking Goodnight Olive because the last time we were at Keeneland in 2015 for the Breeders' Cup, uh, Chad Brown won this race uh, with Wavell Avenue, who uh, kicked off a really good day for me. Yeah, Wavell Avenue had some more odds than I think you get on Goodnight yeah. Olive. I think she has to be the favorite off her recent form. People love to bet Chad Brown. But Goodnight Olive certainly is dangerous in here. She might have gotten good enough where she can just keep that winning streak rolling in the Philly and Mare Sprint. But on the other hand, I see a lot of speed in here, and I see a Philly who really loves to rally at about seven furlongs, and that's what she's getting in the Philly and Mare Sprint. So in other words, I think this race sets up beautifully for obligatory. Obligatory is eight to one on the morning line. I, I could see eight to one. I could see possibly even a little harder, a little higher, considering Goodnight Olive and Echo Zulu and the defending champion CC and others. So I'm excited to bet obligatory. I think she's going to roll down the lane. Uh, usually when she makes that, when she runs her best race, she gets there too. And I, I just think this race. With still, even without Latruska in the race, there's a ton of speed. I think it sets up beautifully for obligatory. She'll be my top pick 
in the Philly and Mare Sprint. Matt, we're going to jump to the turf, another five and a half furlong turf race. And uh, the king of five and a half furlong turf races, of course, is in there. Golden Pal loves Keeneland. Go Golden Pal loves the Breeders' Cup. How can you pick against Golden Pal? Right. You said it, Brian. Um, going for his third Breeders' Cup win. He won the Juvenile Turf Sprint. He won this race last year. Um, he's never lost on an American turf course. I don't know, Brian. I just think he's too darn fast for them, the rest of the field. Yeah, and Keeneland's his home course. It, 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 it really looks like a spot where Golden Powell easily could win his third straight Breeders' Cup, his second in the Breeders' Cup uh, turf sprint, and, of course, he won the juvenile turf sprint uh, a few years ago. Golden Powell's the horse to beat, but I think Golden Powell is uh, hovering around even money, and there's some very good Europeans coming in, notably Highfield Princess, and she's got some good speed. There's other horses, Americans, too, that have some, some serious speed. My reason for trying to beat Golden Pal here, Matt, is I wonder if he's as good as he was last year or even as a two-year-old. There, there's just been a couple of things that I've seen that make me think maybe he's lost just a little bit uh, if he is pressured early. And that's hard, uh, harder said than done because he is so darn quick out of the gate and so darn quick down the backstretch. But if he does get pressured, I think I think there's a good chance that they beat him here. I landed on a horse named Creative Force who... If you look at him, he hasn't won anything big this year. But on the other hand, he's run a ton of good races. He's a group winner over in Europe. He's a horse that can come from the middle of the pack for trainer Charlie Appleby once again. I think Creative Force is destined to run a good race here with the early speed. It might be a, a situation where he's moving up into second or third in the stretch. But uh, I'm going to give him a shot at double digits, certainly, here in the turf sprint. Next week, we'll go to a race, Matt, where I see we are on the same horse once again. I like it. The Dirt Mile. And I'm going to call this Dirt Mile a pretty darn wide open field. Yeah, I agree with that, Brian. Pretty wide open field. Horses that, um, you know, some of them are, are tweeners. If you talk about uh, going in the sprint at six furlongs or going in the classic at a mile and a quarter and their connection just saying, hey, my horse can't go that short. My horse can't go that long. And, and looking for a Breeders' Cup spot, I think Cyber Knife is one of them. I think Cyber Knife may be connections saying, you know, we got pretty close to Epicenter and the Travers, but I don't know if, if we want to knock heads with Flightline. I feel like Cyber Knife, you know, Arkansas Derby grade one, Haskell grade one over Taiba, maybe is getting overlooked a little bit. They've forgotten about all of the good things and the game finishes that Cyberknife has had this year. I agree with you. I, I think the odds will be right on a horse who probably is the class of the field. And, and I probably should take probably out of that sentence. I think Cyberknife is the class of the field. And the reason he'll have some odds in here is because of the Pennsylvania Derby was a little bit dull where he was a well-beaten third behind Taba. You only have to look as far back as the Haskell to see that he can run with true grade one horses when he beat both Taba and Jack Christopher in the uh, grade one Haskell at nine furlongs. I think this is a better distance for him. It's a mile, but really, as we've already discussed, it's it's a mile and 70 yards with a 210 yard run up because of the configuration of the Keeneland track. Uh, so I think he gets a distance that he likes and uh, the class of the race, and I'm willing to forgive the Pennsylvania Derby where he still didn't run badly. He was just a little farther out of it than he wanted to be, and Tabor ran big that day. Cyberknife has a big shot. We might be talking about four to five to one on the classiest horse in the race. Having said that, Laurel River scares me. The, the, the two races he's run this year, Cody's Wishes on a big winning streak, Senior Buscador, Simplification, uh, even slow down Andy. I think there's a lot of interesting options in this race. And by no means by us both picking Cyberknife to at least I feel like he's a, he's a sure thing. But in a wide open race, I'm going to go with the class. And I think that class is Cyberknife. All right, Matt, three down, six to go on Saturday. Let's keep moving along. You ready? Let's go. Who is your Philly and Mare Turf pick? Hey, Philly and Mare Turf, a race that the Europeans have dominated as of late. Um, I'm going with Nashua um, coming over from Europe. 
last time she was second in the prestigious pre opera at Longchamp and and earlier this summer is the winner of two group one races this is a classy european philly in the philly and mayor turf i agree with you again nashville is the philly to beat and 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 if i'm really being honest with myself i think she's got a, a great shot to win this it's interesting that all the europeans coming over are three-year-olds uh, and, and some of them are very accomplished nashville being the most uh the philly that that ran third to her just a nose behind her last time i I think Nashville is a little bit better than I think the wet turf probably uh, uh, was not the best situation for Nashville last time when she ran second uh, in Paris. But uh, Nashville is certainly the Philly to beat. I have nothing to knock against her other than she's a three-year-old and she's already done a lot this year. We'll see. I'm actually jumping on another three-year-old, though, because I think Moira is uh, a pretty special Canadian bred. Uh, there's not a lot of Canadian breds in the last 10 years that can compete with the best horses in the world. But Moira might be that filly. She's looked that good to me. Uh, she debuted in a stakes race uh, last year as a two-year-old, and, and they knew what they had in this daughter of Ghost Opera. She's been terrific ever since. Of course, she made mincemeat of the males in the Queen's Plate on their synthetic surface at Woodbine. And I think her turf race, which was her first, the grade uh, grade one EP, EP Taylor last time, was better than it looks. Uh, she just had a horrid trip, and then she caused other horses to have a, a bad stretch because she, she created trouble after being in trouble for much of the race. Uh, I think it was a good effort, and I think she can move forward. I think this is a good distance for her. Again, this is a race with a lot of interesting horses in Italian and certainly other Europeans besides Nashua. Uh, but uh, for my money, Nashua is clearly the one to beat. Let me hit the right. There it is. Nashua is clearly the one to beat, and Moira is a uh, interesting filly. I guess I'm kind of rooting for her, too, being the Canadian coming down with all those tough Europeans. All right, Matt, the sprint. Uh, we went the other direction here. Last race, you were on the favorite. I picked a long shot. This <clears> time, <throat> I am on the favorite as my top pick, and you are on the long shot. CZ Rocket, that pick surprises me a little bit, sir. Well, I'll tell you what, Brian. Um, yes, the the complexion of the race certainly changed when Chad Brown announced that Jack Christopher was not going to be in the race because Jack Christopher clearly would have been my top pick in 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 this spot. Um, everybody's saying, and Brian, you're probably going to say it when you talk about your pick of Jackie's Warrior, that now the pace scenario uh, um, is all in the way in support of Jackie's Warrior. Uh, doesn't look like there's a lot of speed. Doesn't look like anybody's going to go and pressure Jackie's Warrior. But I'll tell you what, Brian, uh, um, I'm not convinced that... Uh, Jackie's Warrior is as good as so many of those victories have seemed. We all agree that the sprint division has been pretty weak recently. I might be wrong. I can't believe that there isn't another horse in this race that's going to go and pressure Jackie's Warrior a little bit. I'm going with a bomb. I'm going with CZ Rocket, trained by Peter Miller. Yes. That's sneaky Peter Miller, who has dominated the sprints in the Breeders' Cup on dirt and turf for a couple years, not too long ago. He signaled that he might be back in form with a very close second place finish in the Santa Anita Championship uh, to prep for this race. Yeah, I get it. He's an eight year old now, and maybe his better days are gone, but I'm hoping that there's a little bit of pressure and CZ Rocket can come running. I, I hope I hope you're right for your sake, Matt. CZ Rocket uh, should have huge odds. I uh, First off, the Jack Christopher situation, uh, what a disappointing situation that is in that uh, it seems like uh, Chad Brown was just anticipating that the vets would scratch uh, uh, Jack Christopher from the Breeders' Cup sprint without any real good reason other than he's he's got a funny way about him. Uh, when he moves uh, uh, on the on the uh, on the track, and and he thought that he would be scratched. It seems like there are some s serious sour grapes, maybe from last year. Of course, he ended up with a bone chip, 
when the vets scratched him before the Breeders' Cup Juvenile last year, but uh, more recently at Keeneland, Dol- Dolce Zell was scratched out of the Valley View Stakes, was a vet scratch, and Chad Brown uh, went slightly ballistic on that decision. So I think there's uh, I think there's some sour grapes on Chad Brown's part, and we don't get to see a really good horse, one of America's best horses, uh, Jack Christopher, in a showdown with Jackie Squire, and I think that's what it would have been. Now, I just don't see anybody who can keep up with Jackie's Warrior uh, early, and I think that's been a recipe where Jackie's Warrior is, is just about unbeatable, especially at six furlongs. He's been pretty unbeatable this year, other than the seven furlong race last time. Six furlongs without much speed, I, I just think Jackie's Warrior is a pretty darn safe bet to win the Breeders' Cup sprint. He's He's had everything against him, really, in the first two Breeders' Cup uh, efforts. The Breeders' Cup Juvenile was too long against really good two-year-olds, and then uh, last year a, a lot of speed, and he came out of it sore. Uh, this year, I think he gets what he's been wanting, uh, a, a relatively benign early pace, six furlongs at Keeneland. I, I think Jackie's Warrior gets it done finally in the Breeders' Cup. Matt, we're on the same horse in the Breeders' Cup mile. No surprise there. Modern Games, I think, is a pretty special three-year-old miler. Yeah, I agree with that. And I and I do want to say that uh, he was a last-minute top pick for me after domestic spending drew the 14 post position. And, yeah, I know you can say it, Horse Center fans. Matt always says, hey, I'm not a big post position guy. And I'm not a big post position guy. But. Coming back from that long layoff, drawing the 14 post position uh, made me change from having domestic spending as my top pick. I think domestic spending is going to run a huge, huge race. I still give him a chance to win the race. However, Modern Games is a very good horse also. And, And with that 14 post, I went with Modern Games on top. Yeah, domestic spending is uh, is is kind of a wacky entrance in the Breeders' Cup mile. Although we've seen uh, horses coming off long layoffs, Animal Kingdom came off a pretty long layoff to run a huge second to Wise Dan uh, uh, about a decade ago out in Santa Anita. Then of course we saw De Haas come out of nowhere with only a minor race at Colonial Downs after two full years off, and he won the Breeders' Cup mile. 15 months off for domestic spending. Domestic spending was a terrific horse with a really nice turn of foot, as we saw several times in his three-year-old and four-year-old year last year. 15 months off, the 14 hole. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I would have picked him if he had a better draw, but uh, an interesting horse and the way he's working, yeah, you'd have to think he has a shot. But I think Modern Games has proven it time and time again, whether we're talking about Europe or over here with his two performances in North America. I like modern games. <coughs> Excuse me. Matt, we have three more big ones. Let's jump right into one of those big ones. It's the Philly and Mares going in the nine furlong distaff on Saturday. This looks like a really good field with a lot of big names. Once again, we're on the same horse. Yeah. Hey, Brian, that's an excellent field in uh, distaff. Uh, loaded with grade one winners, loaded with millionaires. Nest and Malathot coming from the barn of Todd Pletcher with fantastic records. Clary Air coming back uh, um, after having that uh, incident in the starting gate earlier uh, in the summer. Um, Clary Air, who has beaten Malathot twice. I think it's going to be a really good race. I, I think maybe we're going to see a really special st- uh, stretch run uh, involving those three horses. I think. Nest is going to be sitting, you know, third position maybe earlier in the race and get first jump on this field. Um, For me, that Belmont Stakes performance by Nest and her progress thereafter made her the top choice for me. And she is the top choice for me. I I just think she's a little bit uh, uh, more explosive, more sensational, more brilliant than the older horses. Malathot certainly is a uh, very similar record, same trainer, same uh, sire in Curlin, uh, same unbelievable breeding. 
But uh, Ness has just been that horse who has that extra certain something uh, this year. And yeah, how can you not like her last four races? A very good after a stumble at the start, second to Mo Donegal against the boys in the uh, final leg of the Triple Crown, and then romps, absolute romps in the Coaching Club American Oaks, Alabama, and the Bell Dame. I, I, I think that turn of foot of Ness, that ability she has to turn it on quickly, will be the difference in the distaff. But Malathot is awfully good. She's three for three. Keeneland, Clarier, you can draw a line through the last race in my estimation. Clarier just banged herself up pretty good in the in the starting gate, and that's why she didn't run. Don't forget, she beat Malathot in the two races previous to that. So Clarier is a big threat. Maybe the horse I'm looking forward to betting the second most in the distaff. Society is dangerous. A lot of people are jumping on society, but I, I don't know if a three-year-old speed, speed filly uh, they don't have a great history in, the, in a race like the Breeders' Cup this staff, and I don't know if she'll have it easy with search results hounding and maybe awake at midnight even, a long shot out there a little bit as well. Nest not too far behind, Malathot not too far behind. So I don't think society gets it done. I, I, I think it's uh, I think it comes down to Nest and, and maybe the older horses. Search results certainly can't be eliminated either after running such a big race last time in the personal lesson when Malathot got her late. Uh, very interesting addition of the distaff. I think Nest proves that she's the best female dirt horse in the world, though. In the Breeders' Cup turf, Matt, a uh, lot of good options here. You went uh, with one of the best options for sure. I went with a little bit of a bomb. Who's your pick in the turf? I went with Rebels Romance, Charlie Appleby. Um, this turfer has got four wins in a row the last two in group ones in Germany. And I guess some people will uh, pick on that as a contentious, uh, as a reason to discount Rebels Romance saying, oh, they were in Germany. Oh, they were in Germany. Yeah, but before that, uh, uh, Rebels Romance has plenty of good races uh, in Europe. Um, I'm going to go with Charlie Appleby in the turf. Yeah, Rebels Romance, I, I consider him the horse to beat. And and if you haven't been paying attention to European turf racing or international turf racing, I've been betting German, especially 12 furlong German horses for years now. And you just see it everywhere. Canada, Dubai, uh, the, the ARC last year, for example. Uh, the German horses that run in those big handicap races, are those are good races. And Rebels Romance has been good enough to win he just finishes off all his races strong. He had some hiccups uh, after a long layoff. He was a classy dirt horse who came over for the Belmont last year and, and had a, a hind leg infection. But Rebels Romance is, I think, for real and very likely to run a good race. William Buick interestingly picked the three-year-old Nation's Pride over him. Uh, and, and I think that was against some of the... Uh, 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 feelings of the stable there, but uh, I, I like Rebel's Romance better than his younger stable mate. I think Mishrif is a horse that can't be thrown out, also coming from Europe. But my top pick, Matt, is Stone Age, a, a three year old from Europe. And I like three year olds getting good at this point of the year. Stone Age came over for two races in America, it didn't run badly. And I think people are going to throw him out because he was beaten by Nation's Pride there. But uh, those were shorter than Stone Age wants. I think Stone Age wants 12 furlongs. I'm not sure if Nation's Pride wants 12 furlongs. Stone Age has run against the best horses in Europe, 12 furlongs last couple races and run very well. That experience, good experience in America and the fact that he's getting better and the fact that he's running against probably a weaker field in this Breeders' Cup turf. Then his last two over in Europe makes him a very interesting horse at about 20 to 1 or so in the Breeders' Cup turf. For Stone Age for me, Matt. Let's talk classic real quick. I'm going to throw up the classic uh, uh, full field there, Matt. And uh, this, I tell you what, if it, if it wasn't for a horse named Flightline, this is a solid classic field and, and, and a lot of good horses that could potentially win this. But I think you and I are both in the same train of thought here that flight line is just above and beyond the rest. Yeah, it, it sure seems that way, Brian. Um, in every way, it's, it's really hard to find a reason to fault the uh, flight line. Uh, he's overcome some trouble in races. Uh, 
he's got a tremendous turn of foot. He he whoops the comp. He whoops his competition. Runs big speed figures. Um, it, it it's hard to see him losing in here. You know, uh, people looking for reasons say, well, you know, he he's he's never been headed coming into the stretch. Well, yeah, he's never been headed coming into the stretch, and maybe with this field, it's possible that that happens. I don't see it happening, Brian. I, I think he's just too good. I think he's too good as well. And everything that I've seen in his first five races and every every bit of footage I've seen of his workouts tell me that he's a, he's a special kind of horse, the horse you don't see very often, whether it be in the last five years or, or, or much, much longer. I think Flightline is that special work. We can be talking about him. Uh, among the greatest horses that I've ever seen. And and, and I feel almost bad saying that because he's only had five lifetime races. Yeah. But the, the fact that horses just run a lot less nowadays than they used to and the fact that he has looked so effortlessly awesome in all five of those races, going back to his debut performance uh, a, a year and a half ago or so, uh, makes me think that Flightline is just too good. There's a lot of good reasons to bet against Flightline. Having said everything I said, you're going to get two to five, one to two, three to five on a horse who's only had five lifetime races, only had two races this year, is clearly facing the best uh, field that he's ever faced, is clearly facing the best speed horse that he's ever faced in life is good. So there are reasons to think maybe Matt and I are just not uh, on that page with flight line thinking that uh, these other horses can beat him here. Matt, I think Hot Rod Charlie's the horse that I'm going to throw in as a long shot to be in the trifecta, but uh, maybe Taba or Epicenter, maybe Epicenter for me, is the horse that I think is most likely to run a big race behind Flightline, or if Flightline stumbles at all, maybe Epicenter's the most likely winner. Yeah, well, you said it earlier when uh, we were talking about the turf, when you said, I like three-year-olds at this time of the year. And I feel that same way about the three-year-olds uh, in the classic, especially Epicenter and Taba. Um, in looking for a horse to finish in second, uh, I, I lean to, towards one of those two and maybe Hot Rod Charlie. Uh, horse Center fans may be saying somebody put their hand on Matt's forehead right now because I didn't hear him mention life is good from Todd Pletcher's barn. And, and yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you should be uh, seeing if I have a temperature uh, at this point, but I just feel like, um, you know, if you're looking to bet in the exacta, um, life is good is, is going to be really short. I don't know if the mile and a quarter is the right distance. Um, so uh, I'm going to take a shot for second place with Epicenter and or Taba and then maybe Hot Rod Charlie also. Rich Strike doesn't seem to be as good as those horses that we mentioned. Yeah, one thing about Rich Strike, the Kentucky Derby winner, is he's really the only true rallier in the field. Um, Happy Saver is a horse who can grind up for, for a spot at long odds. I just think Hot Rod Charlie is the more dependable of the long shots to get in the field. We haven't even mentioned Olympiad. Nice yeah. horse, but I don't think this race sets up great for him. And Life is Good, a really, really nice horse. But again, I just don't think this race sets up for him well. A couple of long shots I wanted to mention. I, I mentioned Hot Rod Charlie using a little bit underneath in the classic. I'll be using Flash of Mischief as a, as a bomb in, in the sprint underneath Jackie's Warrior. And uh, also Ivar, I'm not sure how big a long shot Ivar will be, but I, I could see easily Ivar running a big race in the Breeders' Cup mile uh, and perhaps even a Woodbine mile exacta coming to fruition once again. Matt, we went through 14 races. Now it's time for you to give me your parting shot, Breeders' Cup, any more horses that you love or, or just a bit of sage advice for all our viewers out there. Yeah, I would say whether you're going to be at Keeneland for the races or whether you're going to be watching from the comfort of your home or at your local racetrack, um, my biggest advice is uh, don't try and bet all 14 races uh, in the Breeders' Cup. 
that's a recipe for a long and tough day. Uh, pick your spots. Look for the races where you want to beat the favorites and go to a better price. And I think Brian and I have given you a lot of really nice options to choose from in that regard. Anyway, we appreciate your watching. Good luck this weekend in the Breeders' Cup. Well said, Matt Shipman. Uh, I want to thank all the viewers out there for uh, continuing to stick with Horse Center after all these years, and especially, of course, during the big races like the Breeders' Cup. If you haven't yet hit that uh, subscribe button, do it now for us here. That helps Matt and I out. Thanks to Derby Wars, the best contest site out there, our sponsor. And thanks to our friend Candace Curtis for the race graphic. Folks, have a great week. Good luck on the Breeders' Cup. We will be back next week with another edition of Center, but until then, good luck. Enjoy the Breeders' Cup.